Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are based in the world. We have people joining us from all over today. And I'm very excited to, to meet you all and to share information about our PhD program in urban planning. My name is Tom Slater. I'm the director of the PhD program and also professor of urban planning here at Columbia. Um, I joined this university last year after 14 years at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and five years at the University of Bristol before that. Um, by training, I'm an urban geographer, but my work is very interdisciplinary um, and also very community engaged. And I'm broadly interested in urban inequalities in whatever form they appear, whatever manifestation. I'm probably best known for my work on gentrification and displacement, um, but over the last decade or so, I've sort of moved away from that uh, as I've developed a strong interest in the phenomenon of what's known as territorial stigmatization. So, for example, how people are discredited, devalued, treated differently because of the places with which they are associated. I also have long standing uh, interests in questions of housing justice. Uh, most recently, I've been working on how questions of stigmatization and housing intersect in the city of Cape Town in South Africa. In a moment, I'm just gonna ask my colleagues to introduce themselves. But the format for today is I'm going to cover some of the basics of our program, give you a, a sense as to what it's, what it's like here, what it's all about, the kinds of things that we cover, what to expect. And then I'll move into general information about the admissions process. I should probably start with an apology because many of you have written to me to ask for individual meetings or written to one of my colleagues to ask for an individual meeting. Uh, you'll probably realize that we don't do that simply because there are so many of you who are interested in studying here, which is of course wonderful to see, but it does make it difficult to answer and meet you individually online. So this is why we do a group session. And also many of your questions are similar. And so after I've gone over the program and introduced my colleagues, there'll be uh, an opportunity for you to ask questions. And you're welcome to do that in the chat and you're welcome to do that in person uh, after I've given an overview. Um, so it's so not in person, uh, by opening your camera and, and talking to us if you want to. So um, that's, uh, that's an in introducing myself. Let me just uh, give you a sense as to, like if you're thinking, why should I come to Columbia, right? There are many urban planning PhD programs to choose from all over the world. What is it about this place? Uh, what is it that we do here? Maybe what do we do differently? And what are we particularly proud of here? So let me share some of those things with you. The first thing is that this is a, uh, a very dynamic and flexible curriculum. I'll give you a sense uh, in a moment as to what kind of courses that you have to take and the kind of courses that we offer, not just in GSAP, the school that you, you'll be based in, but across the institution. Another thing about us is that although most of us have a background in urban planning here, the people that will be teaching you, all of us are very, we, we read widely across disciplines. We're always going to conferences that are interdisciplinary. We engage with people, whether it be academics or practitioners who have different perspectives, different approaches to studying cities and thinking about problems in cities and how they might be addressed. So I think one of the things that really makes Columbia distinctive is uh, how interdisciplinary we are in, in our approach to, to what we teach. And that feeds through to not just the PhD program that you're interested in, but also our master's program. And the PhD and the master's programs here, there's a lot of dialogue between those, by the way. So you're part of a large graduate student community in urban planning when you come here. Another thing which I think characterizes our program is the focus um, on social justice, racial justice, and climate justice in urban contexts. These are areas of specialization that we share as faculty. And uh, I think broadly, this amounts to a critical approach to the study of urban planning. And if I reflect and think about the PhD students that we have here, all of them take a critical approach to their work by which I mean they're asking very broad questions, uh, even though they're focused on specific topics and regions and contexts, they're asking broad questions about, for example, urban planning for whom, urbanization for whom, urbanization against whom, questions of who decides, democratic and political questions come into the kind of work that we teach here and the kind of work that our students are doing. 
More recently, uh, with the appointment of uh, my colleague Anthony, who I'll introduce you to in a moment, we've developed a specialization in urban science and analytics. And Anthony will tell you a little bit about that in a moment when I introduce him. But that's an emerging strength that we have also uh, at Columbia. Another thing to, uh, that I think is important for you to understand as uh, people who are thinking of applying here is uh, how international uh, our focus is. So we have comparative perspectives and knowledges that we are interested in. We're interested in drawing upon to understand cities, to understand planning, to understand the world. We bridge and learn across and between the global north and the global south. Although we simply cannot cover every region of the world, we're interested in what we can learn, particularly from contexts which are often off the map in terms of urban planning debates. And so not only our own teaching, but in terms of the kinds of speakers that we bring in, and I'll tell you more about these programs in a minute, we really want to learn as much as we can from different parts of the world uh, about this thing called urban planning and different knowledges, different and often marginalized forms of knowledge. We're interested in bringing that into how we understand and think about and train uh, people who go into uh, academia in, um, in urban planning. We also uh, take pride in the fact that we really prepare students for whatever career that they may have in mind, right? So most people uh, come and do a PhD with us because they're interested in an academic career, but that's not always what people end up going into. Some people go into more specific research-focused careers that maybe don't involve teaching. Others go into professional practice in planning. So we uh, like to think that um, we prepare people well for these careers and we give advice that, uh, and the university itself has uh, excellent resources um, for helping you along uh, with this particular process because I'm sure you're already asking yourselves, why should I do a PhD? And it's important to think about where you might wanna be in five, six years time as you're going through that process. Another thing to bear in mind here about Columbia is the wider institution. Uh, it's a quite remarkable place to be in terms of the intellectual environment. One of the things that I've noticed about Columbia, I've only been here for just over a year, there's always something exciting happening intellectually. There's always amazing speakers who come to the city. There's always exciting events to attend. And often you can find yourself in something which you don't know much about and you find it's completely riveting and amazing. And that's one of the really remarkable things about Columbia. Of course, it's difficult to ignore the fact that we're in New York City as well, which is one of the most remarkable places to be an urbanist, whatever your field of specialization. Uh, so it's an incredible, inspiring environment in which to, to, be, a, to be training as an urban planning scholar. And finally, the PhD student community here like I said, I've only been here for just over a year, and one of the things which I've been so delighted to see is how our PhD students are very much, uh, I think the best way to describe them as a tight unit. They are quite amazing. The friendships, the bonds, the networks, and the way that they work together to get the best out of each other and the program. They really are quite amazing, our group of students here, and um, it's just so exciting to see how they support each other, they look after each other, and ultimately that makes their studies much richer and more inspiring and a pleasure to be part of. Okay, so that's one thing which I've really noticed about this place, and I think it's a pretty special atmosphere that our students have created. Um, another reason, perhaps the most important reason, uh, is we have uh, some wonderful faculty. I have some amazing colleagues Here's just an, uh, some photographs of the kind of work that they're producing. But uh, I think having introduced myself, I will now invite our colleagues just to, to speak for a couple of minutes about who they are and what, it, what the work that they do is all about. So I will hand over to my colleagues and hopefully somebody will volunteer to go first. Hi, uh, I can go first. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Hiba Boakar. I'm associate professor in the urban planning program. Uh, I teach uh, mostly theory classes, the masters, the planning history and theory for masters. I, I teach the advanced theory, planning theory course for the PhD and um, a few electives on related on issues of crisis or issues of segregation, um, uh, exclusion in, in cities. Uh, my research on, is on cities in conflict and post-conflict cities and the role of planning that plays in issues of constructions of what is peace, what, what is war, and the role that religious organizations play in shaping cities. 
Uh, my field site is Beirut, Middle East, but I theorize from there about the foreclosed futures of that that um, shape our current moment in terms of like whether it's a future of war or future of climate uh, crisis or future of a pandemic and how that shapes or how does that affect how we think about planning and urbanization processes in general. Uh, happy to answer any questions you have about my particular work. I also lead the, found and direct the Post-Conflict Cities Lab and GSAP, and we've been doing work um, in uh, in different parts of the country and many students uh, are affiliated with it doing their own projects and we think comparatively and relationally but also bringing questions also to think about New York not only in like so thinking between the global north and global north uh, south and this is one of the features of our program is that we decenter the production of knowledge by thinking relationally between the geographies of not only cities here, but cities in the global south and how to think about like informality, conflict, contestation, climate crisis, gentrification um, across these uh, geographies. Uh, welcome, I'm happy to answer particular questions. Yeah. Thank you, Hiba. Um, I'll just pick somebody to go next. Hugo. Sure. Um, hey, nice to meet you, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Hugo Sarmiento. I'm an assistant professor here um, in urban planning. I've been here for a couple of years now, going into my third year. Um, so my, my work is um, focused on the housing and land use strategies that um, cities are developing in response to the climate crisis. Um, uh, my geography has been Latin America, um, Colombian cities in particular, um, Bogota, Medellin, Cali, uh, where there's a lot of experimentation in these strategies. Uh, but since I've been here in New York, I've also started to develop uh, projects here in the city, as, as Tom mentioned. New York City is this vast urban uh, lab uh, in which you can explore all kinds of different dimensions and facets of urban planning. Um, so I've working here with communities impacted by rising sea levels and flooding um, and studying uh, their, their community-based uh, responses um, to these uh, climate risks. Um, I rely on also on political economy, critically engaging some of the, the dominant paradigms in uh, climate research, um, so uh, resilience theory, socio-ecological systems theory, really trying to um, deconstruct and unpack um, what those conceptual frameworks um, have to offer in our in our understanding of um, the climate crisis. Um, let's see what else. Um, I in my work, I, I try to center the role of communities, um, of grassroots efforts, insurgent planning practices, and shaping um, these strategies in cities. Um, I. Let's see, I have an affiliation here with the Climate School with the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes um, and help advise um, some of their programs and classes um, on related topics. And um, here um, in urban planning, I teach uh, planning methods, also teach electives on political e urban political ecology and climate adaptation um, in a global context. Um, and uh, yeah, again, it's very nice to meet you all and I'm happy to take any questions um, if you have them. Um, excited to, to see where we go from here. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, Wei Ping. Hi, thanks, Tom. Um, welcome all. Uh, Wei Ping Wu, um, been here for, this is my eighth year. Uh, I also direct the master's program in urban planning and my own work uh, is primarily uh, located in East Asia and China. And I look at how migration and urbanization affect um, migrants who come to cities uh, in terms of their housing experience, settlement experience. I also look at how uh, local governments um, manage land and through land uh, also financing urban infrastructure. And I also have some other projects. But you know, increasingly with the doctoral students that I advise, I'm also supporting them to look at some of the emerging technologies uh, how they are used in uh, urban governance and also engagement of various different citizenry. So um, I have been teaching the doctoral um, colloquium on applied qualitative methods, but now in my capacity also as vice provost for academic programs in Columbia, I continue to advise doctoral students. I also have to apologize to a lot of you on the screen who might have written to me by email, I simply do not have the uh, time to respond individually. And I think Tom will talk about this later that uh, generally 
it, you are best served to uh, uh, approach Tom as the program director uh, and for kind of questions related to the program. Thank you. Thanks, Wei Ping and Anthony. Hi, everyone. I'm Anthony Vanke, and amongst my colleagues, I think I'm the self-professed nerd or geek, as Tom kind of alluded to uh, just a few minutes ago. I'll admit, I really do hang out with our IT department quite a bit. Um, but while my doctoral training you know, happened when the smart cities discussion rose, began, and subsequently fell, um, I still look at how we use digital data and computational social science tools to understand the city. So, you know, uh, in my classes, I we we talk about everything from blockchain, big data, AI, and of course, all the discontents. I'm really more interested in what we do with the data and how we apply it back to urbanism in meaningful ways. And uh, like many of you, I have a background in urban design. So I'm also interested in how we apply imagination and a social lens to those critiques. Specifically, I think uh, a trademark of my work is that I engage urban technology through the lens of critical making. So instead of just always relying on data sets that are readily available, I'm really interested in both how do we create the data through sensor networks or other means, but how do we apply other epistemologies to understand the city in ways that I think are more meaningful to us um, in kind of more equitable ways, such as thinking about lived experiences, affect, embodied data, the lived experience, and what that might mean for um, you know, larger efforts towards policy, but also advocacy. Uh, as I said, I'm also a designer. So some of the questions I look at are also related to how we think about the built environment and how we enumerate aspects of design. Uh, somehow by coincidence, I think I'm the Americanist amongst my colleagues, uh, just because by chance, a lot of my projects now are in the US. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work in Southeastern Michigan um, and the American Gulf South, of course, New York City. Um, and I'm also affiliated with uh, the Data Science Institute. So I have a connection with colleagues across the institute, across the university that are working with data science in different ways in the different disciplines, as well as being a co-director. Uh, there's many of us, so that sounds much fancier than it is, of the Center for Smart Streetscapes, which is a multi-university NSF supported initiative. Um, so there's engagement you know, with engineering, as well as some of the others who are also self-professed nerds and geeks. I um, mean, I look forward to the conversation that we'll have um, as we continue with this discussion. Thanks uh, to all my colleagues. I hope uh, just by their introductions there, you've got a sense as the sheer breadth and depth uh, of the kind of work that we do. But we're very happy to answer questions if you want to put them in the chat or even afterwards, um, after I've just concluded my short uh, uh, introduction here. Uh, let me just move on to the next slide. So um, I mentioned a, a dynamic and flexible curriculum. And this means that in the first two years, the foundational years of the PhD program, uh, we we have courses which we require that you take, and um, I won't give a description of all of these because uh, I think it's probably best if you have any questions to ask about them. But broadly speaking, what these courses do is that they provide you with both the theoretical and methodological foundations, which we consider to be absolutely crucial for any student in urban planning. Um, and what we do is usually these these take the these take the form of kind of small group settings where often they're like pre-assigned readings and we have really fantastic, often intense and exciting discussions about particular uh, particular readings or even particular approaches, whether they be theoretical or methodological uh, approaches. So those are the required courses. We also require that you have in the first two years of your program here that you take additional courses in research methods, which could be either in GSAP, the school, or even beyond GSAP as well. And we also have courses which uh, we require that you take that are related to your research specialty, right? So you come here usually with you know, a, a clear idea as to the kind of urban planning themes that you're most interested in. And we advise that you take three or more courses related to what you see as becoming your research uh, spe uh, specialty. Okay, so those are the uh, courses that we require. We also recommend that you take a couple of courses that are offered to our master's students in the master's program. Again, important foundational courses, the history and theory of planning, and also Ge uh, GIS, Geographical Information Systems. So in the first two years, we do have some requirements, but we consider those to be absolutely essential for any student moving forward once, uh, once you go, go past those first two years. 
And in fact, what you often tend to see is that some really exciting research ideas come from students taking these uh, particular foundational courses. There are also opportunities across Columbia to take classes, right? I already alluded to that in the previous slide, but we have uh, obviously a very exciting and vibrant and dynamic intellectual environment, right, in this um, in this part of the world. And uh, there we go. We have, uh, I mean, this, this is actually uh, like, this is not an, like a, a full list uh, of all the departments and all of the programs in which you can take uh, courses across the institution. And in fact, we encourage and advise that you look broadly because as we are all interdisciplinary, we like to think we lead by example. And that means that you'll go and explore courses, for example, in anthropology and sociology and public health, right? So these are the kinds of things which we think is so important for any doctoral student in urban planning to have as broad a perspective as possible because often debates happening in other disciplines can make you think differently about the work that you're doing in urban planning and then also so you might think, well, hang on a second, we've been reading this in urban planning, I can bring that into an anthropology setting. And often you'll find that you can get really exciting conversations and even eventually collaborations with students in doctoral programs in other parts of the institution or in master's programs even. So there are opportunities across uh, this place for really exciting uh, intellectual endeavors. Uh, so that's just a, a, just an example of the kinds of uh, schools and programs uh, that you might be in and, and disciplines that you might be interested in having a look at. In terms of resources and support here, well, um, all of the students, we admit three students a year. It's a small program, it's a competitive program. But in a sense that the small size of the program is actually its strength, because I talked about the strength of the community that forms among the students. Students who are admitted to the program are offered a full scholarship for at least five years. Um, and the second and third and fourth year of that scholarship at the moment, we require uh, students to be teaching and re or research fellows, right? So you have teaching obligations or research obligations um, in the form of what's called a fellowship um, when you are a recipient of a full scholarship. We also offer annual summer stipends, which are uh, available to help uh, with any research that you are, with whatever research that you are doing. Some, some of you may be interested, for example, in doing international field work, and that summer stipend may help towards that. Um, also, we have research workshops, which are student-led. So uh, we actually have, um, among the PhD students, they, they bring themselves together and they invite us along to talk about an idea they've had, to talk about a current problem they may have with their work that they want to sort of, you know, workshop, if you like, and have a, a sense as to, you know, whether they might be heading in an interesting direction or not, or what they might consider by airing it among their peers. The second year doctoral students are in charge of the programming of a really thriving series called the Lecture in Planning series, or LIPS. And pretty much every fortnight, a speaker external to Columbia, uh, sometimes international, is invited um, into uh, GSAP to, to give a, a lecture as part of this series. And not only do they do that, and it's always an interesting occasion to hear just the exciting work going on uh, from urban planning professors elsewhere, but they also tend to come along and listen to what the students are doing and offer their time and, and just engage with the PhD students as part of that invitation to give a lecture in that series. Also students are, that, that, um, take um, workshops that are aligned with professional development in whatever way, in whatever form that may take. And also here at Columbia, there's opportunities for uh, collaboration with faculty, right? So that might be who eventually becomes your advisor, or it might be somebody else who you don't even know who that is right now. But there are opportunities to actually get involved in even large or even small uh, research projects during your time as a student here. And uh, you will hear about those uh, uh, as part of the program, right? Because once you're here and embedded in this context, then you get to, you know, you get to see what kind of opportunities there are more broadly to get to actually get some research experience that may or may not be related to the PhD project that you're pursuing. Right, the application process. Let me just go over this briefly for you. And this is really why we're all here, right? I'm sure you want to know more about like, okay, how do I apply? What kinds of things might you be looking for? So this is real the kind of crunch time of this session, right? So application and review process. The deadline is the most important thing, December 14th, 2023. Okay, so just under a month away. 
Um, and I'm going to give you in a moment some sort of top tips which uh, I have brought to this reflecting on last year's application process. But let me just give you a sense as to what's required. So we are asking students to provide evidence on critical thinking, right? Recall about 10 minutes ago, I talked about the critical ethos of the program. Okay, we're really interested in questioning, not just um, particular policies and particular planning strategies, but thinking about the, the status of the field, thinking about how we might move forward urban planning as a discipline in whatever way we might do that. Okay, so thinking about how we can create better and fairer cities, but also think about how we can create a better and fairer discipline as well. Right, so critical thinking and independent research to provide evidence on those things is really important. Writing ability is important. For those of you who don't have English as a first language, I do recommend if you have the ability to do so, to get your application text checked before you submit it. I was quite surprised last year how there were some applications which maybe hadn't had the chance to do that for whatever reason. But if you can, just get somebody to check over uh, your application. It does, um, it does help the application, obviously. But also we ask for a writing sample. So it could be, um, well, first of all, nothing too long because we won't have time to read it if you send something that's just you know 200 pages don't do that right so don't for example send your entire master's thesis or something just don't do that we're not going to be able to read it but a small example of your writing that gives us a sense as the kind of writer that you are the kind of scholarship which you bring to this environment something sort of snappy and punchy that's really kind of engaging and riveting whatever that may be if you can uh, offer that then that makes certainly a more interesting application. Personal statement, I'll give you uh, in a moment some top tips about this, but this is really uh, the, the, the chance for you to share your academic journey so far, the preparation that you've had for a PhD program in urban planning, and that means that you need to talk about topical or theoretical areas of interest. And as part of that process, you should also uh, tell us about your experience with analytical reasoning, including, but not limited to, quantitative methods, GIS data analytics, or qualitative methods, depending on what kind of scholar you are, what kind of approach that you take. But we like to see what kind of things have you done? What did you find out? How did you go about doing those things? What have you learned? Where are you going? That's the kind of language which you should be thinking of when you write that personal statement. The review process. Now, this is an important thing here. One of the things that maybe uh, is a little different from way, the way that some other programs uh, in the United States in, in urban planning PhDs operate, a, a different way of operating, is that we do not match students with advisors from the day that they walk into the institution. Okay. The, uh, the matching process doesn't happen until year three and often like far into year three. OK, so for the first two years, at least uh, of the program, you do not have a specific advisor for your studies. That's because we feel that it's really important for you to get to know each of us, to understand the kind of project, to, to get your intellectual development to a point where you really have nailed down the project first before we match it to the advisor. OK, so by saying this, what I'm trying to say is don't put in uh, as part of your application, don't 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 put in like this research proposal that's sort of got a very tight, refined methodology that sort of identifies a specific person to work with, because that's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for students who who are committed to the program more broadly, who are interested in being part of an urban planning PhD program rather than working specifically with an advisor from the day that they arrive here. So we review these applications collectively uh, when, once they're all in. Then we have a discussion with the shortlisted finalists in February, which will be uh, on Zoom. And then following that process, we make offers and we put people on a wait list. And so the time frame for this is March, April, roughly. Again, we can answer any questions that you may have about this process in a moment. Um, Reflecting on last year's applications, I wanted to share a few top tips uh, for those of you uh, applying and preparing a personal statement, which is probably the most important part of your application. OK, and these are things that you might want to ask yourself as you're writing that statement. Again, there's no one way to do this. OK, that's an important thing to recognize. But these are things which when I reflect on the best applications that came in last year, 
And when I reflect on the offers that we made to the student, what was it that made their application stand out? And it's these questions which those applicants had really nailed, okay? Why you? Why now? Why Columbia? Okay? Why does the field of urban planning need you and your work, right? Um, that's a really important question for you to be considering anyway, regardless of what program that you're applying to. What have you done so far that is directly relevant to the field of urban planning? Where are you going? So let's just say that you did uh, a piece of uh, interesting research that became your master's dissertation. Let's think about this. So what was it that really kind of, that got you really excited about taking your research further? Where is it that you wanna pick up on and take forward? What are the debates that are happening in the field? What are the problems that are out there that you think really have to be addressed in academic urban planning? Okay, so what have you done so far that's directly relevant? Where are you going? And also, what are the broad research themes, contexts, and debates that interest you? Okay, like I said, we're not looking for a refined research proposal. It's not a grant application. It's an application to a PhD program. And that means that we like to see students who really kind of know the discipline, who are thinking about urban planning, but also maybe thinking about some of the, the sort of gaps in knowledge that might exist, things that we need to know more about, areas of inquiry that really inspire you and motivate you and make you think, I, I really need more knowledge. The world needs more knowledge on this particular theme. And also a blend of theoretical and empirical interests is important, okay? The strongest applications combined both, right? So there was definitely an empirical interest, an interest in doing research on a particular theme in a particular setting, for example, or set of themes. But also there was an interest in thinking, well, there's a body of knowledge out there. And actually, I think there's more things that we need to know about, right? There's We can move this forward. There's debates which need further empirical work. What are these theoretical debates and how would further work uh, move those forward? So those kinds of things are questions to ask yourself. And the final thing is uh, the best applications uh, to any program, it's clear that the applicant has actually talked to their letter writers about why they're doing this, what kind of uh, scholar they want to become and why they're applying for a PhD so that the person writing your letters of recommendation can actually really speak to that application. So it should be considered a dialogue that then goes into an application between you and the people you've identified to write letters for you. Okay, so the best letters, the most exciting letters, which made me think, wow, this is a really remarkable applicant, showed that that student had taken the initiative to really talk through their applications and then get somebody to support them. They're often called letters of support. And therefore it's really important to talk to your letter writers.